Um, if you have your Bibles, John chapter 7. John 7 is where we are this morning. If you're new, um, as a church, we, we like to go through books of the Bible here at Lost City um, and just study what God is teaching from his word. Um, and so we spend long, long periods on specific books of the Bible. And um, currently we're in a series on the Gospel of John, and we're specifically looking at what does John, the author, teach us about who Jesus is? What is John's, how is John pointing us toward Jesus? And so we're in John chapter 7, and John 7, we're going to continue this morning to look at the skeptics around Jesus, people that were critical, and we're going to look at how Jesus answered them and how the rest of Scripture answers them. Remember that these questions that your family asks, your questions that your friends ask, these questions that even you ask, they're not new questions. A lot of times we think that we are so much more sophisticated in our modern Western culture than so much more smarter than people decades or centuries or millennium ago that um, what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobs, that we think we're smarter than them. But the reality is, the truth is, the questions that we ask, the questions that are asked of us, about our faith are not anything new. There have been questions that have been asked long, long time ago. The writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon said, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing that's new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It's already been in the ages before us. Guys, skeptics have been around long before the world began. Satan was the very first skeptic who thought God's authority and God's position was suspect and attainable and he rose up and he tried to be like God only to be cast down and separated from God. And then our first parents, Adam and Eve, they were skeptical. They were skeptical of God's word to them and Satan comes and he tempts them to be skeptical and to doubt. Has God really told you this? Has God indeed said this? And he made them skeptics. And so the skeptics that you and I deal with, even the questions that you and I ask, even the skepticism of our own heart, they're not new. They've been around for a long, long time. The questions asked and the accusations that are made of our faith are just a rewording, a rephrasing of the questions asked and the objections made of Jesus here in John 7. And in John 7, we discovered three groups of skeptics that Jesus deals with. Last week, we looked at these intimate skeptics that were apathetic to Jesus. These were guys who grew, around, who grew up around Jesus, his brothers. They, they were just apathetic. They saw Jesus. They saw him do miracles. They saw how he lived his life, and yet they just didn't care. They were indifferent to Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at familiar skeptics who are argumentative, the crowds. And next week, we're going to look at distant skeptics who are antagonistic, who really hate Christianity and has it all in and out in it to just destroy it. And they just attack it. So this morning we're going to look at familiar skeptics who's represented by the crowd. And we will find objections against Christianity. And we're also going to find subsequent answers to those objections. Now what I'm going to do is four objections from this text that people that love to argue bring up. And you'll discover that in our text are the same things that you and I will hear in our conversations with unbelievers. Number one, Christianity is just about morality. Christianity is just about how you live. It's just about living a good life. This is the assumption of most people you talk to, even if they don't come out and say it. It's no no doubt the assumption that even some of us in this room are making this morning. People may even have an appreciation for Jesus' teaching and think he did some good things for society, but at the end of the day, he was just a good man, a good teacher who gave you good advice for how you live. And we find out the crowd around Jesus some 2,000 years ago thought the exact same thing. Verse 11, the Jews were looking for him at the feast, saying, where is he? Where is this Jesus? And there was much muttering about him among the people, and while some said he's a good man. So, as we, if you remember from last week, there's this festival going on, this feast is going on, and the people are camping in their tents around Jerusalem, and the talk this year is all about Jesus. Everyone wants to know, what is Jesus up to? What's Jesus doing? Is he going to show up? And everyone has an opinion about Jesus. Yeah. Everyone does. One group thinks they're defending Jesus by calling him a good man, but they don't realize they're actually blaspheming him, because he's not just a good man. Listen, Jesus can't be just a good man, and Christianity cannot just be about morality. That's not an option. C.S. Lewis would say, 
Jesus is either a liar or he's a lunatic or he's got to be Lord. Even Napoleon the Great would say, I know men, but Jesus is not, is much more than a man. So let's look at the reasons why Jesus can't be just a good man. Let's look at the reasons why Christianity can't just be about morality. Number one, the nature of Jesus' teaching. Jesus' teaching was very egocentric. It was all about himself. His teaching was all wrapped up about himself. He made claims that if it wasn't true, they would have made him an arrogant man, an evil man for saying them. For example, he claimed to be God incarnate, and if that's not true, then he's a blasphemer. And that might not be a big deal for our culture, but back in the Jewish culture, that was a huge deal. And it was the worst thing to claim to be at the same level as God. And as a matter of fact, if Jesus' claim was not true, then he broke the entire law of the Old Testament, and he was a cruel and evil man. Jesus would make statements like, your love for me has to be so much that it almost looks like you hate your family. But make statements like, man, if your hand causes you to sin, if your eyes cause you to sin, why don't you just cut them off or pluck them out if they keep you from following me? Let nothing stand in the way. If he wasn't God, then he was a lunatic. And he promises eternal life by saying, no one comes to the Father except through me. No good person would say this if it wasn't true because he's giving false hope. And listen, false hope is one of the most wicked, sinful acts that any human being can do for another person. It would almost be like a bridge collapses and a police officer is standing at the front of that bridge and, um, and it, you're coming up and he talks to him and he says, hey, it's okay, everything's okay, you can keep going. And you, all the while you're driving the man and saying, man, that police officer was a nice guy, but you're driving right down to your death. Jesus' nature of his teaching was all about himself. Number two, his reception of worship. Jesus commanded people to follow him, not just his teaching. Huston Smith, in his book, The World's Religion, says, there's only been two prominent and influential figures that their lives have had so tremendous effect on people around them that people didn't ask just, who are you, but what are you? Those are Buddha and Jesus. And in both instances, people wanted to worship them. But Buddha said, don't worship me, just follow my teaching. But Jesus would consistently accept worship and say, follow me. When the apostle Thomas fell at the feet of Jesus and exclaimed, my Lord and my God, Jesus didn't go and say, stop, Thomas, that's blasphemy. You've gone a little too far. Jesus accepted it. And if he wasn't God, then he was the most egotistical man ever to live on the face of the earth. A third reason why we believe that Jesus is God is his forgiveness of sins. He claims to forgive sin, not merely sins committed against him, but also sins against others. C.S. Lewis said that unless the speaker is God, this is so preposterous, it's almost comical. If someone hits you, you have the power to forgive them. If they bump into you, you can say, hey, don't mention it. Don't worry about it. If they steal from you, you can forgive them. But suppose a person goes around hitting other people, thousands of them, and stealing from them. In that case, you and I have no right to forgive them, and you shouldn't regard anyone highly who thinks that they have that right. But Jesus would forgive the sins of people that not just sinned against him, but also sinned against other people. He forgave other people's sins. And number four, the point of Scripture for people who claim that Christianity is just about morality, they miss the entire point of the Bible. They read it just like any other religious textbook with a list of do's and a list of don'ts. And this is why people say that all religions are basically the same because they look at the moral teachings of Scripture and they, and they all seem to repeat for other, other, every other holy book. But every religion, every other religion is about rules and regulations and laws so that you have to keep in order to be made right with God, morality. But Christianity is about a story. Yeah. It's a story about Jesus who came and obeyed all the laws fully and kept every rule on your behalf and then caused you to live by faith in him, and him alone. See, if you don't see Jesus and his living the life that you couldn't live and dying the death that you should have died as a central point of scripture, but rather you feel like you need to obey the rules as central, then you're into religion and you've missed the forest for a few trees. 
And the result is you'll constantly be banging your head against the wall like any person in any other religion, trying their best to live up to the commands of the holy book and expecting that God will hopefully approve of them with no assurance that they've done enough good for, people to, for God to accept them. Listen, the commands and the ethics of scriptures were made to point you to Jesus. The laws were made to point you toward Jesus. The little stories in scripture are meant to point you to the big story of Jesus. Christianity is not about morality. It's about Jesus and the cross that he bore. And until you see that, you will think it's just like any other religion out there, full of things that I need to do to be made right with God. So Christianity isn't about morality, even though it produces a people who follow Jesus with all their lives. But you don't do it to get God's approval. You do it because God has already approved you. It transforms people from the inside out, converts them, resulting in people who want to obey Jesus, not needs to obey Jesus. Objection number one, Christianity is about morality. Objection number two, Christianity is unreliable. You ever hear that from anyone? Well, how do you know the Bible is true? The Bible is full of errors, and I'm not committing to anything that I'm not sure about. How do you know that this scripture is not things that were just made up or changed? This is an incredibly popular argument in our postmodern culture, and we probably hear this argument more than any other argument out there. Again, these same objections were being directed at Jesus 3,000 years ago by the crowds. The crowds didn't feel that his teaching was reliable or that what he was saying was really true. Look at verse 14. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and began teaching. And the Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it this man has learning when he's never studied. See, in this culture, you never made statements on your own authority. You always quoted another rabbi or another leader or another teacher. It's like those pastors at Tikrain Calibrity, they consistently quote John Piper or Tim Keller or um, N.T. Wright or C.S. Lewis. Yeah, I don't think you guys know anyone like that, right? Um, um, but it's kind of like those kind of pastors um, who just has to claim other people so that you're like, oh, Sam didn't say C.S. Lewis said it. It's acceptable, right? Um, and that's what these religious leaders were like. Hey, I'm not saying this. This old rabbi said this. And here stands Jesus in this peasant role with his scruffy beard, worn out sandals, with no training, with no learning. And he explains the Old Testament teachings to people, and they're dumbfounded. They're amazed. Verse 16. So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own authority. So they're, I love this, they're questioning Jesus' competence as a teacher, and Jesus turns around and questions their competence as hearers. He's like, you're questioning my ability to teach? I'm questioning whether you can even hear what I'm saying. He's saying, you're having a hard time accepting what I'm saying because of the log not because of logic, but because of your heart, because of your will. The reason you don't believe what I'm saying is because you don't want to believe what I'm saying. Listen, listen. God doesn't give you assurances of truth just to satisfy your curiosity. If you are truly wanting to know, it will be made known to you. Verse 18. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him, there is no falsehood. Jesus, here is not just saying that his teaching is true, but he's saying he himself is true. Everyone else at that time was saying, thus saith the Lord, and Jesus would over and over say, truly, truly, I say to you. In fact, 72 times in the Gospels, Jesus would make that statement, I say this to you. Jesus is staking his claim that what he is saying is true because of his own nature. If he is true, if he is true, reliable, and accurate, then what he says is true, reliable, and accurate. Listen, that topic of truth is a major subject in the Gospel of John. Nearly 20% of the verses in the Gospel of John deal with the issue of truth, and the term appears three times as much in this book than any other book in the Bible. Verse 19. Has not Moses given you the law? And yet none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Jesus, again, basically saying, you don't believe me because you simply don't want to. He says they've been given a revelation by Moses and that they fail to believe it, which is proven by their disobedience of it. You see, God 
has given you a testimony of himself, not just in scripture, but through creation, through conscience, through common grace. There's revelation everywhere, and yet you choose to reject it, you choose to deny it. But listen, many will look at scripture and say it's unreliable. They will say, that's great that Jesus said that, but how can we be so sure that he said that? Haven't people changed it over the course of the years? Hasn't there been like 50 million translations of the Bible? And we'd answer no. We believe that every word of Scripture is completely true without error. Let me give you a few reasons why. Reasons why we believe Scripture is absolutely true. Number one, the claims of clear history. Listen, my friends, this Bible that we read, that we meditate on, is a historical book. It's written as a history book. It claims to be valid history, not a fictional story. Maybe you've never really, really read it, but it doesn't begin with once upon a time. It doesn't begin a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. The book of Acts begins by addressing a guy by the name of Theophilus. Matthew begins with a Hebrew phone book, a genealogy. And then consider all the details, specific details that are mentioned in the stories, in the Gospels. Details like a man named Simon of Cyrene would come and carry the cross of Jesus. Specific details. Names his father. Names his family. Incredibly detailed about who these people were. Add to this the claims in Scripture over 4,000 times where the Bible claims to be inspired. Not only this, but Josephus and others in the first century who weren't Christians wrote of historical facts that were in the Bible. If you think you can't trust the Bible as his accurate history then you might as well be consistent and say you can't trust any historical fact because there are more historical evidence in the Bible as fact than any other historical document out there. Number two, the existence of eyewitnesses. The books and the letters of the New Testament were written about 20 years after Jesus died. If it was lies, then people would have complained, people would have rioted, people would have burned their copies. They already didn't like Jesus, but they didn't. You lie about stuff only after eyewitnesses are dead. Only a fool would tell a lie while people saw the events and can say, listen, he's, he's nuts. He's just making stuff up, right? They would not be spreading lies when there's witnesses around that could prove them otherwise. But the apostles wrote of their records of the gospel while the eyewitnesses were still alive. First Corinthians, Paul would say, that Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And Paul continues, he says, some of them, most of them are still alive. Most of these people that saw Jesus, they're still alive, even though some have fallen away. Not only that, but the writers give exact details of what occurred, proving that they got their information from eyewitnesses. And listen, the fiction of today and the fiction of biblical times are quite different. In our day, fiction is told as if to sound true. But fiction back then was told as if to sound untrue. Iliad, Beowulf, it didn't, they didn't, it was mystical, it was, it was fantasy world. They didn't give details like the Bible did of Jesus step, sleeping on a boat on a cushion, of details like 153 fish being caught, or Jesus riding in a sand. It was very detailed, it was very personal. Third reason why we believe scripture is true is the dedication of the disciples. Some people get brainwashed and swept up into cults, but eventually those cults are exposed for what it is and people stop following them. But in Christianity, millions and millions of people have given their lives for this truth. People were dying 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. People were dying 500 years after Jesus rose from the dead, 1,000 years, 2,000 years, and even in our day where there's more persecution of followers of Jesus than ever before, people are willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. Listen, no one is willing to lay down their life for what they believe to be a lie. And yet Jesus has convinced hundreds of thousands of people around him that he was God and people died for their fact. They refused to deny the Bible as the word of God and thus they became martyrs for what they believed the Bible said about Jesus. And think about it this way. If the disciples were really trying to pull a wool over your eyes, really trying to deceive you, why would they record all of their failures? Why would they talk about all the times they've messed up, they screwed up? Why would the leaders of the church air out all of their dirty laundry for all of us to read about? Tim Keller would say it this way, why consistently de depict the apostles, the eventual leaders of the early church as petty, 
as jealous, almost impossibly slow-witted, and, and as cowards who are either actively or passively failing their master. Even Peter denied Jesus to the point of calling down a curse on his master. Why would anyone in the early church want to play up the terrible failures of their most prominent leaders? The, 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 the dedication of the disciples and objection number three against Christianity by people that are argumentative. Christianity is evil. It's hurtful. It's a very another common argument today. Basically, people would say that religion, in general, it doesn't just have to be Christianity, but religion as a whole, and even Christianity is the cause of so much war in the world and so much evil in the world. The thought is that if there was no religion, then there'd be no war and no violence. And they fail to realize that there have been more people that have died under the regime of atheists and secularists than any other religious group. Think about the regimes of Stalin and the French Revolution. These are atheist groups. It makes us wonder if it's not a religion problem, but if it's a human problem. Let's look at how Jesus answers them, and then we'll talk about this for a little bit more. Verse 20. The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? The crowd here is basically the pilgrims who came from various places for the feast. This is not the Jerusalem mob that will attack Jesus in a few chapters. They saw him as a deluded madman, someone quite possibly possessed by a demon. They would come back to this conclusion three times in the book of John. But could he be working for Satan? Cannot Satan do good works? Verse 21, Jesus answered him, I did one deed, and all of you marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the, man, if on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a whole man's body well? So Jesus is talking about that story in John 5 where he, heal, he heals that man who's been paralyzed for 38 years. He heals that man at the pool. And it was on the Sabbath day. And if you remember, the religious leaders were, they were so mad because, not because they, Jesus healed a man, but because he healed him on the Sabbath. And Jesus is trying to show them, hey, you guys break the Sabbath every single time when you circumcise a boy on the eighth day. Because in the Old Testament, you're commanded to circumcise a boy on the eighth day, whether it's a Sabbath or not. And it was, if it's okay to fulfill an unnecessary medical operation, Jesus is saying, why is it not okay to have a man who's been paralyzed for 38 years get up and walk? Circumcision was a medical attention to one, man, one part of a man's body, and it's actually taking something away from that boy's body. But Jesus was making a whole body well. He was restoring wellness to a person's body. And these people knew that they had no grounds for argument against Jesus. They just didn't like Jesus, and they didn't like someone telling them that they hadn't lived up to the law of Moses. You know what they do? They resort to name calling. And so they begin to call him Sabbath breaker, lawbreaker, seducer, drunkard, glutton, have the most disgraceful of friends. He's destroying orthodox religion. He's demon possessed. So you got to ask, was Jesus really self-deceived or maybe demon possessed and didn't know it? Was he completely mad, a basket case off of his rocker? The light was on, but no one was home. He wasn't playing with a full deck. He was a few fries short of a happy meal. Was that Jesus? He was either the complete, most completely sane person in the entire world, or he was a raging lunatic. He chose a cross when he could have chosen power. He became a suffering servant when he could have easily been a conquering king. He washed the feet of his disciples when he could have had men kneeling before him everywhere. He came to serve when he could have subjected the world to serve him. Let's take that argument for a second. Let's assume that Jesus is suffering meant from mental delusions of grandeur, that that's what he really is. Did he act like someone who was crazy? Jesus spoke with silent authority. He was always in control of every situation. He was never surprised. He was never rattled. And all of the quality of his work was outstanding. If he thought he was God, then why didn't he go on a campaign trail like so many in that day and age wanted him to do? Why did he go through towns and villages and rural areas healing and casting out demons from poor, helpless people and not frequenting the doors of palaces and courts? If he was crazy and possessed, 
then he was the most eloquent and brilliant demon-possessed man ever to live on the face of the earth. You try to say the things that he said. He left religious leaders speechless. He still leave, leaves people speechless by the things that he says. Tim Keller would say no one has ever discovered the words that Jesus ought to have said or the deeds that he ought to have done. Nothing he does falls short. In fact, he's always surprising you, taking your breath away because he's far better than you and I can ever imagine. He is the most incredible man ever alive. But what about this accusation that Christianity is the source of so much war and conflict? We've all, that Christianity is basically evil. Well, we've seen that the founder is an evil. But let's look at this accusation. Let me give you three arguments why it's not. Number one, Christians are Christians by grace alone. There are many people in the world that assume that if you're a Christian, then you should be perfect, or at least very close to it. And I don't know if you've met them, but they're really, really quick to point out the hypocrisy of people that claim to be followers of Jesus, and when they screw up, they all start coming out of nowhere telling you how you're a hypocrite. They say the church is full of hypocrites, and so they don't go. And listen, if you ever find a church that's not full of hypocrites, can I encourage you, please don't go there, because the moment you go, you've ruined that church. Right? Um, some of you may have very moral friends. They might not even be followers of Jesus, but they have more morality than you do. And you wonder why that is. You see, even though the trajectory of the Christian life is moving upward to become more and more like Jesus, you've got to consider where they are coming from the beginning. For example, if someone grew up in a very moral family with bo both parents who cared for them, poured into them, and they didn't know Jesus, they may look different from someone who might have been in prison for 20, serving a 20-year sentence and in prison comes to faith in Jesus and now is coming out and trying to figure out his life. Right? Keep in mind that the church is not a museum for saints, it's a hospital of sinners. It's a hospital of people who are fallen, who are desperately in need of God's grace day in and day out. Claim number two, or reason number two, many who claim Jesus don't really know Jesus. There are those in cults, false religions of the world who claim Jesus, they're not really, they're not really Jesus. Jesus is going to look at them and say, I have no idea who you are. There may be people even this morning here who claim to be followers of Jesus, but you don't really know him. You're not really following him. Maybe you're here because you're checking off a religious duty that you have to do so that you can earn God's acceptance and favor. And favor. There's always tares among the wheat. Much of what we see in the media that's done in the name of Jesus today is not done by God's people. Those who hold up banners at soldiers' funerals saying God judge these men for their, our nation's sins are not the followers of Jesus. Gospel and religion are polar opposites of each other. You say, but they look so committed to Christianity. Look at them quoting verses left and right. I mean, they're at church all the time, but you need to know there are people who are fanatical, and they're not fanatical because they're committed to the gospel. They're fanatical because they don't understand the gospel at all. They're committed to religion instead of the gospel. The gospel, if they really understood this and it really takes root in your life, produces a people of humble boldness. They're fanatical in one sense because they'll die for Jesus, not kill people for Jesus. But they talk with people and show people so much grace because they themselves are the recipients of so much grace. Religious people without the gospel are some of the most hateful, bigoted people on the face of this planet. And you've got to call them out for what they are. They are not followers of Jesus. They have to find someone to look down on so that they can feel better about themselves and their moral performance and so always find people that they can judge. Number three, true Christianity, true followers of Jesus show justice, do justice and show mercy. When someone is truly converted and becomes a follower of Jesus, they are overcome by grace and they are transformed into people who love other people. The Bible speaks about justice and mercy just about as, any, about as much as any other subject in Scripture. But only a person that's transformed by grace and belonging to Jesus will experience a love inside of them for people that are different from them. This is why in Matthew 7, 
Jesus will say there were many that would come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do miracles in your name? Did we not do all this stuff in your name? And Jesus will look at them and say, I don't even know you. I don't know who you are and where you came from. It's because they didn't do justice and show mercy out of compassion and love for people, but they did stuff only to show that God, hey, look at all the good things I'm doing, only to prove themselves to God. This is why Jesus commends the Good Samaritan in the parable who showed compassion, who showed kindness. And listen, if you read church history, you'll find that justice and mercy and compassion is the backbone of our faith, is what it's built on. When the plague was destroying Eastern Europe, the Christians stayed there and cared for those who were dying. It was built on caring for those who were hurt. It was built on standing up as a voice for those who were experiencing injustice. It was built on standing and saying, listen, I might be unpopular for doing this, but my love for Jesus compels me to love my neighbors, whether they're different and whether they're they're outcasts. It causes me to stand with them. Christianity is a gospel. Christianity, when it sinks in, makes you thrive for justice and compassion and mercy. Objection number four. Really quick, Christianity is just too narrow. Christianity is just too narrow. You can't know for sure you're right. You can't know for sure that Christianity is the only way. There has to be other ways to God. What about all these other religions? This argument is seen in the word no there in verse 7. It's in this text seven times between verses 25 and 31. This is, there's this, almost this mystical view of the Messiah that his origin won't really be known and no one would really know for sure. Verse 25, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not this man the one whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Can it really be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? The crowd is beginning to wonder, is there a conspiracy theory against Jesus? Maybe the leaders know the truth, but they're faking it and hiding it from the crowd. The crowd claims to know a lot of absolute things, but they're still going to claim that there's no absolute knowledge of Jesus' birthplace. See, that's the way it is with people. No one believes in no absolutes, although they claim it. Even though they say there's no absolutes, they don't believe that. For a belief in no absolutes is a belief in an absolute. And no one is truly inclusive. Everyone is exclusive. Right? All those people that say, we need to be inclusive. They're very exclusive of people that claim to be uh, of people that love Jesus. Verse 27. We know where this man comes from. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. And this seems to be a popular opinion of the day. The one thing that we do know is that we don't know. This is strange because there's passages in like Micah that say the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And commentators are not really sure why the crowd believed this, but they, we can assume that it sounded good and pious, right? I mean, one thing that we do know is we don't know anything. Um, for, if the, for if they really knew, then it puts, that puts every man as king and able to make a judgment. The crowds might have believed this, but the Jewish leaders never would have. And it's possible that the crowds believed this because it put them on par with the Jewish leaders, and they were tired of the Jewish leaders mocking them week in and week out. Verse 28, so as Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me, and you know where I come from? Basically, in other words, do you really know me? Do you know where I came from? You don't have a clue, dude. You have no idea about me. What you claim to know, you don't know, and what you claim to not know, you actually do know. There was plenty of evidence that Jesus was more than just a baby born to Mary in Bethlehem. We know this because some of them, in a few verses, will lay down their pride and submit to Jesus in this passage. The truth is, Jesus didn't have an origin. Verse 28, but I have not come on my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you don't know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. See, it was an incredible claim for Jesus to make that Jesus alone knew God and the crowds didn't know God at all. That was an incredible claim. They were at a feast celebrating this God. And Jesus comes in and says, you don't even know what you're celebrating. You are so clueless. You are so blind. But you're 
doing things have no idea. You're seeing, but you don't really see. You're hearing, but you don't really hear. Their pride was so much in the way. Their eyes were too busy looking at themselves that they couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see their Savior standing right before them. Verse 30. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. You see what pride does there? To claim to know nothing is really a statement not just of ignorance, but it's a statement of arrogance. And when Jesus exposed that, that they did know certain things that they, ought, that they thought they didn't know, what do they do? They get mad and they try to kill Jesus. See, many today claim that knowing God absolutely and personally is impossible. You can't know God. You don't know who God is. And they look at you and they see what you do and how you live your life and they call you arrogant. And they get angry when you say that they're wrong, that the Jesus is the only way. No one gets more angrier than when you attack their brains and their thoughts. But, they, but you only react that way if your identity is in your brain and your thoughts. The bottom line is that all of us in this room believe in absolutes. And you all try to convert people to what you believe in. And that can be true of sports teams. It can be true of faith. We all have absolutes of what we believe in, even if you don't call it a belief. The question is not, do you believe something? The question is, why do you believe what you believe? If you claim that Jesus isn't real, why do you believe that? You want to know for sure you can be forgiven. You want to know for sure that you are loved. You want to know for sure that you're doing the right thing. Let me tell you this. Only in Jesus can you begin to see your guilt not, on, not counted against you, but also just completely washed away from you. Only in Jesus can you begin to see that despite your lack of faith and assurance and welling up of pride, you are more loved than you've ever thought possible. Only in Jesus can you begin to know that you are standing on a solid ground and that the path that you are on is leading to a beautiful world full of peace, perfection, and love. Deep down, all of us want this. Look back at the text, verse 31. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than what this man has done? These people, even though they were skeptical at first, through thinking, though thinking that you can't know for sure, believed or at least started to doubt their doubts. They looked at the evidence and thought, could anyone really say the things that Jesus is saying and do the things that Jesus is doing and not be the Messiah? And here's the thing. They don't come close to what you and I know about Jesus and what he's done. They don't even come close. Because in six months, Jesus' time would come. And the Lamb of God would quietly go to the slaughter and show us the most amazing love in the world. He would willingly and freely have his hands pierced with the equivalent of railroad spikes. He would willingly and freely have his head punctured with many thorns. He would willingly and freely be mocked at and laughed at and scorned from hundreds from the angry mob and he would willingly and freely bleed and suffocate and die for you and for me. And then he would willingly and freely rise from the grave. He would willingly and freely move that stone away. He would willingly and freely welcome back his retreating disloyal friends. He would willingly and freely go back to the Father and send us his Holy Spirit and he would willingly and freely come back and make all things new and create for us a new earth full of justice and truth and beauty to worship and enjoy him forever. Isaiah 53 says it this way. And would you meditate on these words as we prepare for communion? Prophet Isaiah prophesies and says this, who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, 
He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way, and the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. God knew that we wouldn't come to him, and so he sent his son to us. Instead of crushing us for our hatred of him and refusal to believe in him, he turns around and crushes his own son in our place. He treated Jesus as if he lived your life, and he treated Jesus as if he lived my life, so that this morning he could treat you and I as if we lived the life of Jesus. When God looks at you and God looks at me this morning, he doesn't look and see all the sins you've done. He sees the righteousness of Jesus all over you. But Jesus had to go to the cross for that to happen. So listen, if you're here today, can I encourage you, would you begin to doubt your doubts if you're doubting? And if you're beginning to doubt your doubts this morning, can I tell you more about this amazing Jesus that we love and worship? We're not here to introduce you to religion. We want to introduce you to Jesus, the living God. 